It's time for a big question and answer session. I asked you all for questions on my Facebook page the other day. I previewed the questions and I got some stuff together here to help me answer the questions. Let's get to it. The first question is from Joey. Joey says, favorite mirrorless camera? Nikon V1. And my second favorite is the Nikon V1. <laughs> They're up to the V3 now. I just use the V1. You can go with higher and better specs than the V1, but with a bunch of DSLRs around, I wasn't looking for a DSLR substitute, just something small with interchangeable lenses. They can also do some amazing things with my Nikon F mount lenses. The next question is from Juan. Juan says, I got rid of my 70 to 200 F 2.8 since it was too short. Now, what lens would you recommend for wildlife slash birding? Have you played with the 300 F 4? Thanks. Hi, Juan. The road I took with this is the teleconverter that someone else actually also mentioned on the Facebook post. But no, there's, there's no substitute for the quality of a prime lens. If it's wildlife, yes, you may want to get the highest focal length prime lens that you can afford. For me, my longest telephoto set, setup is the V1 with its 2.7x crop factor, 1.7x teleconverter, then my 70 to 200 f2.8 lens. This gets me in super duper close and actually with really good quality results at f5.6 or f8. That 300 millimeter f4 lens looks pretty neat, but I've not used it. For that long of a prime, the $1,400 price tag really isn't that bad though. The next question is from Rusty. Rusty says, what was your business plan when you started? How long did it take for you to become self-sufficient? And how has your business evolved to the present? Well, Rusty, I wrote a book on this exact topic. It's on snapchick.com, available for your Kindle on Amazon. And for my beloved VIP members, it's absolutely free. The evolution has been very organic, really, with my YouTube audience as the staple. I found my legs on Facebook, though, and my Facebook following has doubled since December 2013. In today's world, where anyone can really start a social-based business, you have to be ready to change in an instant. What worked last month or even yesterday may not work today. Linda asks, okay, here is an issue I've been struggling with for a while now. I've been doing photography for 13 years and my talents have gotten increasingly better each year, thanks to great photographers like you to help me along the way. I feel I need to charge more, but I get scared that I'll lose business. So how do you go about raising prices? Also, friends constantly invite me to parties at the last minute and say, make sure to bring your camera too. How to approach charging or dealing with friends that you once did for free because they helped me get to where I am today. I'm between a rock and a hard place, but need to put food on the table also. Hey, Linda. My approach to raising prices is to just do it. The better your work, the more price insensitive your clients will be. You will demand go down, it might, but you could also find yourself working less and earning more. It really comes down to marketing. Find the type of client that you would like to serve and then tune your marketing focus specifically to that market. Friends and business, always slippery. I've got two answers to the party question. For one, you can say, I've been working with my camera all week. I just want to come to the party and have a good time like everyone else. This reinforces that photography is your work. Some people at the party might work in finance, but I doubt they'll start opening up spreadsheets during the festivities. Now for the right party with the right people, you might want as clients, bring your camera, have a good time, and maybe bring a portfolio magazine like you can build at magcloud.com. This is different than bringing a formal album or passing around a laptop. It has the exact look and feel of a magazine. Use it to show off your own family photos even. People might just say, wow, how can I get something like this? And of course, then you can lead them down the path as to how you can bring the service of stunning family portraits and cool albums into their lives. The next question is from David. He says, what's on all the shelves? <laughs> I've got cameras, lenses, and their related accessories. It's a collection that's always changing and evolving. One thing is certain, I have too much gear. Specifically, too many camera bodies. Lenses, you can never have enough. Bodies, I could probably get rid of five bodies and not have any problems. Alan asks, is VR or IS all it's hyped up to be? Hmm, it depends. In the studio, not needed. Wide sweeping panoramic landscapes, not needed. On a photo safari, bumping around in a Jeep, yes, that is a good time for it. 
it certainly doesn't hurt to have it in almost any circumstance. And the technology is getting better and better. You can shoot handheld at slow shutter speeds not previously thought possible. The catch is that if there are moving objects in the frame, it's not going to keep them still. I do like it when shooting sports or nature with a telephoto lens. Not only will it reduce blur due to the camera shake, but since it's stabilizing the image in the viewfinder, it's easier to compose when working at long focal lengths as well. The next question is from Chandler. He says, as a freshman in high school, how would you recommend I further my photography business to where I can actually give a price instead of taking whatever money I get? There's no one right answer. If I were in your shoes, the answer would be to turn down business that doesn't meet my desired pay. The fact is most people will see you as being worth what you charge. Now, since you're getting started, you could easily price yourself out of the market. Two approaches to try, and you can readily flip flop between them, is one, ask people to pay you what they think it's worth to them. Be prepared to sometimes get less than you expect, but often more as well. Option two is to lead with a strong portfolio and put a big fat price on your services. If you've got a strong portfolio, go with option two. If you're still in a portfolio building mode, go with option one until your portfolio is ready for option two. Are these the only two ways of doing it? No way. <laughs> but these are two approaches that I personally recommend. Nathan says, do you have any film cameras at all? Absolutely. My beloved Nikon FG. <laughs> I do wish the exposure meter in the viewfinder weren't those bright red lights. An analog exposure meter would be cool. My Nikon N65 is a lightweight film DSLR that is compatible with all newer autofocus lenses produced today. It's not packed with features, but it's fun to pick up and run out the door with it. Jonathan asks, should, you should do a video featuring all your equipment. I tried to count the stuff in your picture, but I ran out of fingers. Oh, also, how about a month theme using film? Any kind of picture so long as it was shot on film. I've done a few in the past where I've shown you my equipment. Usually they're out of date almost before I upload them. I'll do another one soon though, maybe with the gear that I'm keeping and the gear I'm selling. Probably no on the film theme though. I do shoot more film than a lot of people and I'm working my way through a case of Tri-X. I know that many of you out there are shooting film, but from a social media standpoint, I'm not sure how many contributors we'd get. On the other hand, I'd love to see more film scans pop up on my Facebook page. If you all would like a film month, post some film shots on my Facebook page. If there's enough interest, we'll go for it. Josh asks, I'm always on the go and more often without my DSLR. Is there a good pocket camera that I can carry that has decent dynamic range to give me a quality photo? There's a lot out there. Everyone's definition of pocket is different too. The only truly pocketable camera that I have is my phone. For something bigger than a pocket, but smaller than a DSLR, I use my V1. Juan asks, I'm sure this is a dumb question, but is the light source that makes the bottom photo look like a picture from a magazine and the top one look like a live TV shot? Not a dumb question at all, but to me, this is all about depth of field. The blurred background is typical of what you would see in a magazine, while live TV, like news footage, tends to have everything in focus. Charlie says, what is your favorite camera lens filter? Well, I find myself using them less and less but I guess you could say that it's this yellow filter when shooting Tri-X outdoors. On newer DSLRs, you can simulate this right in the menus when shooting in black and white. For black and white film, you can get the improved look of a yellow filter on the fly with one of these. Mike asks, um, I dig the shelf set. I need something more like this for my older cameras. Hmm, I see sawdust in the future. <laughs> cool, show it off when you're done. Jonathan says, I too want to know what you would recommend for wildlife photography, especially birds. Have you tested the Nikon 300 millimeter F2.8, 800 to 400 millimeter F4, or a Sigma lens? I use that Frankenstein setup that I talked about earlier. V1 plus FT1 lens adapter, 1.7x teleconverter, and 70 to 200 f2.8 lens. Sam asks, what guide number of flash or speed light would we need if we intend to use speed light indoors as well as outdoors? I mean, what guide number flash would you recommend if we are restricted to use a single flash both for outdoors and indoors? If you want just one flash for everything, get the most powerful one you can afford. I have a few of these older SB800s. If I were buying today, I'd be getting the SB910. Andy asks, how much time do you spend editing an individual picture and do you use any particular Lightroom or Photoshop preset more than others? Thanks. I recently picked up the latest Photoshop and Lightroom versions. 
Really though, I use Aperture 3 on my Mac almost exclusively. I'm not a big post-processor. Most of my images are never post-processed and the ones that are, I only spend a minute or two. For people who do spend time post-processing, there's nothing wrong with it. We all do the art of photography differently. I like doing my work on the scene and less on the computer. Other folks will tell you that the real art is creating the image later on. As for presets, I enjoy using the Nick filter set very much. They're owned by Google now and their price of the entire suite has really come down. There's Silver, Silver FX Pro and Color FX Pro, which I use the most, but there are others in the package too. It's a great set. Mark says, I've always wanted to ask, why do you have a camera body without its body cap on? Thanks. <laughs> Mark, that's a great question. <laughs> for working cameras, I always have a body cap on. This old D100 took an unintended swim about 10 years ago. I keep it on my shelf to show people the inner workings and to remind myself that DSLRs they can't swim very well. Renee asks, I see an underwater case for a camera. What do you think is best, a case like yours or an underwater bag? Well, if underwater photography were a larger part of what I do, I would get an underwater DSLR hard case. There's a couple of reasons why I don't have one now. One is for DSLRs, they're very expensive, often more expensive than the camera body itself. And two, hard cases are specific to one specific model of camera. So you have that one camera that can use it and that's it. For casual underwater use of my DSLRs, I use this underwater bag. It's not as easy to use as a hard case and it's a little cumbersome, but it gets the job done. Uh, hard cases for point and shoot cameras like this one are much less expensive than those for DSLRs. And then also cameras like Nikon's AW1, which will work underwater without a case, are becoming more popular. If I were buying a travel body today to use in addition to my DSLRs, it would probably be a small underwater solution like the AW1. Jeff says, I have a Nikon D5100. What is the best way to take pictures outside when you have shade coming from the trees and the sun is out? Is it another flash or what? I have the 55 to 200 Nikon lens and the 70 to 300 Tamron lens. Well, Jeff, you're definitely on the right track. You want to fill in those shadows from the trees if you're taking a portrait in the woods. A lower cost option would be a reflector, but this often requires a second person to reflect the light in just the right way to fill in the shadows. Mark says, just a little Nikon envy. I see a, an empty container. What's your favorite Chinese food? Hmm. I make a lot of faux Chinese food at home. I get a black pepper sauce from Trader Joe's that I mix with a little tamari and I saute it up with a whole bunch of vegetables and some raw cashews. They seem to kind of soak up the flavor a little bit and it's super duper good. Paul says, hi Lee, my question is, do you have any tattoos? <laughs> Funny you should ask. I do have one that shows up in my photos from time to time. I have nothing against tattoos and will possibly even get one again in the future. However, I'm in the lengthy process of getting my current one removed sort of outgrew it. It's not so much regretting getting a tattoo as it is for getting the particular tattoo that I did. And in fact, I had a tattoo removal treatment today and it hurts right now. <laughs> Nathan says, you take such amazing photos. Thank you, Nathan. I'd love to see some wildlife photography from you more. And this is a two part question. Is your PIXMA Pro expensive to operate ink costs and how often do you refill? Um, well, you know, what's funny is that I see wildlife a lot <laughs> when I'm in northern Arizona and even when I'm here in the valley. Um, I'm always studying it, which means that while I'm gazing at it, my camera is still hanging off my shoulder. It's funny how that works. And depending on how you use the inkjet printer, it can be expensive. I use my PIXMA for short runs. I'm on my second set of cartridges. Canon actually replaced the first set along with the entire printer. <laughs> it's a long story, but it's back and fully operational again. If you use any inkjet printer for printing volume, it can be expensive, but not necessarily more expensive than getting prints from a lab. For me, I like controlling the entire process. So I'm happy to use an inkjet for my own artwork, even if it does come out to be a bit more expensive. If I'm creating something like a large proof book, I'm getting it done at a lab. When something would require a lot of work and it's more volume than craft, for me, that's the perfect time to outsource. That's it, everyone. Thanks for your questions. Feel free to ask me your questions anytime on my Facebook page, on Twitter, through email, 
and I'll talk to you guys later.